How do you do, gentlemen? This is Graham McNamee, the Universal Newsreel talking reporter, bringing you some hot news about General Electric for 1933. Believe me, it certainly is a privilege to bring this news to you and tell you what I think about the General Electric Company and the product that you are going to give the American public this year. What I have learned about that company and how it works and is able to give you products with which you can go to the American public with genuine pride and conviction. And man, it's an honor to be able to tell you what is going on behind the scenes as I have witnessed it with my own eyes. I don't mind saying that I think little Graham is a mighty lucky boy to have had the opportunity to go through that great house of magic up at Schenectady. I know you are all interested in what's new in the 1933 product. There's plenty new, but that isn't the whole story by a long shot. Why, after going through that house of magic, it seems to me that I have had a quick course at Johns Hopkins, Sheffield, and Massachusetts Institute of Technology all crammed together. Old Aladdin rubbed his magic lamp and swept me through the greatest scientific laboratories in the world. Man, oh man, it seems to me that if you knew the things General Electric is doing up there and what it has done, you could sell anything that was the product of those great scientific minds up in the House of Magic. It may be an old, old story to some of you, but to me, it's the greatest story ever told. You know, I used to think that all this altruistic stuff, ha, there's a dollar and a half word for you, about General Electric was just a lot of conversation. But I'm here to tell you that you don't know the half of it. Why, those men up there have worked for years, developing things for the medical profession, for the betterment of mankind, for labor saving, and to end household drudgery. Men, they've just given a lot of their brain children to the well-known human race. When I got through that house of magic, boy, oh boy, did I feel small. The spirit of that great scientist, Dr. Steinmetz, seems to be everywhere up there. Did you know that for years before this great man passed away, he had been playing with high-voltage lightning created right in the laboratory, figuring out the flighty habits of this dangerous form of electricity. And man, it is flighty. Figuring out some way to control it, some way to prevent its destruction of human life and property, and its interruption of lighting service in our homes, theaters, and other public buildings. Certainly you all know about Dr. Whitney's accomplishments with the tungsten filament for the incandescent lamp. But do you know the whole story about the development of lighting? Do you know about Dr. Langmuir's ceaseless efforts? Here's the very laboratory in which he labored so many, many hours. Here's where he toiled putting to work argon, the laziest gas that was ever put to work, resulting in the argon gas-filled lamp, which has affected savings for every one of you because it has affected annual savings to the American public in lighting bills alone of at least a billion dollars a year. That's a thousand million dollars. It has made possible the floodlighting of great buildings like those towering skyscrapers in Chicago, New York, and other great metropolitan centers. The beacon lighting and floodlighting of airports. We do take so many things for granted and mighty quickly forget about the days when no such thing existed. They seem to come upon us so quickly, and we rarely give a second thought to the great minds that spent weeks and months and years figuring out intricate scientific problems to make them possible. It seems to me that from now on, whenever I see that great Wrigley building all lighted up at night, I'll think of Dr. Langmuir and his discovery that argon gas was good for something. You know, argon means nothing. And others said it wasn't good for anything. But it took Dr. Langmuir to prove it was good for something. That no matter how lazy it was, it could be put to work. And men, if he hadn't found that out and put it to work, I doubt 
whether we'd have practical night flying today because it was a development of the argon gas-filled lamp that made beacon and floodlighting possible. So you see, it isn't only the decorative value of lighting tall buildings that's involved, but a very practical value in connection with aviation. And while I am on the subject of lights and lighting, one of the funniest things about it is that even after they have perfected something like this up there, those modern genii are never content. They want to build them better and more efficient and to make them work longer. Why, they've got a death chamber for all kinds of electric lights where they just work them to pieces, eternally, deliberately trying to break them down just to see how long they will stand up in the service and what they can do to better them. Are you familiar with Dr. Gordon's ceaseless activities in connection with the sun lamp? Why? Not just so that we can get a sun tan in our home, but to free poor little kitties of the rickets so they can romp around and play and have a good time. Did you ever hear about Dr. Whitney's development of the fever machine? There is one in the Fifth Avenue Hospital, New York. Dr. Whitney proved that by artificially inducing a controlled fever several degrees higher than the human body can ordinarily stand, disease germs are destroyed with safety to the patient. Dr. Whitney's fever machine has already affected miraculous treatments to unfortunate folks afflicted with arthritis, paresis, and kindred ailments. Now here's another contribution to humanity. Dr. Coolidge's work with the X-ray so that the medical profession might be able to transform low voltage into high voltage in their own laboratories for X-ray work in deep therapy cases. Now there's one thing I didn't know anything about, but I found out that this means first and foremost the treatment of deep-seated cancer, which you all know is one of the most dangerous ills that plague the human race. Here again, they have been laboring untiringly to reduce costs. Here's something else your Uncle Graham didn't know and should have. If it weren't for the things that have been going on up there for ever and ever so long, I'd probably be back home singing in a choir. You all remember way back when radio was new, when it used to come in and out and up and down in peaks and valleys. Dr. Alexanderson's alternator made the smooth, continuous radio wave possible. And Dr. Langmuir's development of the power tube made broadcasting possible. And the Rice Kellogg electrodynamic loudspeaker made our present high quality radio reception possible. It seems to me that many of us forget the days when it wasn't possible to go home of a Saturday in the autumn and sit with a good cigar and listen to a football game. Oh boy, is that a football game. But let's get back to Schenectady. Back there in one of those Aladdin's caves, the galvanometer was developed. What's the galvanometer, you ask? Well, maybe it would be better if I told you what it did. It has resulted in the high-quality talking pictures that you have today so that you can sit in your favorite movie theater and listen to your favorite actors and actresses actually talk. As clear as a bell, as clear as if they themselves were right before you talking across the footlight. Here television is being developed. And just think what that means to all of us. Some of you men will always have to have your bathrobes handy when you're shaving and showering in the morning because a telephone call might come in any minute from the lady love. And if she's right there at the other end, she will probably not only hear you, but see you. And there'll probably be a lot less cheating when television's perfected because it'll be pretty hard to telephone home to wifey about that business appointment when Gladys DeVere or Blondie of the Follies is sitting beside you with her arms around you, gazing soulfully into your eyes. But enough of that. You know, one of the most interesting things that I saw up there was the making of all these strange shaped bulbs for lighting and x-ray and tubes for radio and for all kinds of experiments. Yes, they make them themselves. It seems to me that in every nook and corner of this house of magic, men are working, laboring, ceaselessly, 
untiringly to develop new miracles that today we know not of. There's an unhurried atmosphere, an atmosphere of agelessness and mystery that made a very small person out of little Graham and taught me how little I actually know. And what's this all got to do with the products you're going to give the American public this year? With the refrigerator, for example. Why, I defy you men to go through the house of magic up there and see what I saw and not believe that all these products, this great monitor top refrigerator, must be the best that can be conceived. Why, I saw them testing the copper tubing that carries the refrigerant, testing it on vibrators that were shivering and shaking it more strenuously than it ever possibly could be shaken in service, seeming to shake it to pieces just to find out how long it will last. And if it won't last long enough, boy, it's got to be made better. It might shiver a lot when it gets in the cold atmosphere of that wonderful refrigerator, but it'll never shake the way they shake it up in tests. You know Dr. Langmuir's oil film experiment gave us an entirely new conception of lubrication and won the Nobel Prize for him. With very simple equipment, such as you see here, oil, water, talcum powder, strips of paper, a photographer's tray, he discovered a way of measuring the exact size of a molecule of oil. These experiments led to many practical applications. For example, he subsequently discovered that a film of thorium metal, just one atom deep on a hot wire filament, would make that filament give off 100,000 times as many electrons. And from this, a new and better radio tube was born. And this isn't all. You'll see them test new chemicals, new refrigerants, new lubricants, simply to make the General Electric refrigerator more and more efficient and more economical for the homeowner to operate. And here again is where the human side of this great institution comes to the fore. These men, laboring with all kinds of chemicals, have made discoveries and have been asked to work out things that have literally been given to the whole world, to the medical profession, to the great industries, to all mankind. In another laboratory, you will find men striving for new and better automatic controls, as if that miraculous dishwasher, that range, that refrigerator, were not already like human beings in their automatic operation. And still another laboratory, you'll find men experimenting with heating elements, where Calrod was developed to make electric cookery fast and economical. That doesn't look much like a Calrod coil, you know, but it's good old Calrod just the same. And here's one thing I almost forgot. You know that one of the reasons why General Electric was able to give you a trouble-free, hermetically sealed refrigerator unit was because of Dr. Langmuir's automatic welding torch. Atomic hydrogen. Boy, it took me a long while to get that mouthful. That torch enables General Electric to assure a non-porous, leak-proof, gas-tight welding job on the refrigerating unit. Boy, I could certainly tell you about that house of magic for hours and never get through. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but it seems to me that if I were a salesman and if I could just tell people what's back of these products, I'd make them want them so badly they'd be running round after me. Why think of the engineering accomplishments of this institution? That engineered your dishwasher, your range, and this refrigerator, of all refrigerators. Think of those great turbine generators and power plants that have been conceived by the same engineering minds that have engineered these products. That monitor top refrigerator is offered to you by the same engineering group as the best they can engineer. Think of all those generator jobs, like that miraculous mercury turbine outdoor station at Schenectady like the 160,000 kilowatt job of the Brooklyn Edison Company and the great 208,000 kilowatt job of the state line generating company in Chicago. You know, when we turn on an electric lamp in our homes or plug in the toaster of a morning, it might possibly flash across our minds that that's a GE bulb or a GE toaster. But how seldom, if ever, do we think that that juice that makes the lamp light or the toaster toast is being generated by great, huge generating equipment 
designed and engineered by General Electric engineers. That greatest of all hydroelectric power plants just finished under the five-year plant in Soviet Russia. Some project that. You've got to hand it to those Soviet boys, whether you like them or not. They get things done. What they'll do with them after they have them is something else again. I'll bet many a dear comrade could put a crimp in that wonderful power plant in five minutes, a plant that General Electric engineers sweated over for months and months. But here it is, and the pictures came all the way from Russia. Some pictures. A little gray, but it's the Dnieper River plant just the same. And here are a couple of those famous electric ships, the Saratoga and the Lexington, designed and engineered by General Electric engineers. I suppose our automobile friends in Detroit would call them floating powerhouses. Seems to me they could win a war all by themselves. General Electric engineers are responsible for those great railway electrification projects like the Grand Central Terminal in New York. In fact, they're responsible for the electric locomotive itself. And if you people have to travel as much as I do, you're looking forward to the days when these smokeless giants will pull all our trains and when a man can wear the same shirt getting off the train as he wears on. General Electric engineers are responsible for those mighty modernized power systems in the industrial plants, like the Inland Steel Company outside of Chicago and hundreds of others throughout the country. Great huge manufacturing plants operating automatically in every conceivable way with General Electric power equipment and those electrically operated bridges, like the Michigan Avenue Link Bridge in Chicago. They, too, are the product of General Electric engineering. Here's a little secret about this spot. It was made especially for you. No boat going through. It is the same engineering mind that gave you the GE dishwasher, which I think is one of the greatest robots of all time. Think of it. Washing dishes without human hands. 87 times cleaner then human hands can wash them much more efficiently and saving all that time and nasty work for the dear lady. Here's an experiment that's been made on scores of your refrigerating units which have been in service five years or more. After opening them up, they show imperceptible signs of wear which certainly denotes interminable life. This mechanism is essentially the same as the first General Electric refrigerator ever produced. No fundamental change in design has been necessary. It is General Electric engineers who have made it possible for you to offer the American public this greatest of all electric refrigerators, a refrigerator that dirt and moisture can't get into, a refrigerator that doesn't need to be oiled, a refrigerator that can't be tampered with, a refrigerator without any of the old-time troublesome moving parts, a quiet refrigerator, a refrigerator that doesn't consume any more current than a living room lamp with three 40-watt bulbs in it, would consume if it ran 12 hours out of the 24. The monitor top refrigerating unit has no screw connection. Patented GE metal glass leads protect the owner from leakage. Every joint is silver soldered and built to withstand many times the operating pressure. Man, what an engineering job.